very pleased to be here. My name is Veli Peltola, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about automating Facebook marketing. A uh, little bit about my professional background. Uh, I've mostly been in Aalto University. Uh, I guess the most relevant part in this list would be the years 2005 to 2011, uh, when I was at the Aalto University uh, Department of Information and Computer Science um, and doing uh, time series analysis using Bayesian latent variable models, which, is, which was kind of one of the bubbles that you saw during the last presentation. And uh, one and a half years ago, I joined a company called Smartly.io, which does Facebook marketing automation. So uh, what do we do exactly? Smartly.io is, is what is called a Facebook marketing partner. And uh, we, in particular, work with the largest and uh, most demanding online advertisers, uh, such as Skyscanner, Lazada, eBay, and, and help them get great results with Facebook and Instagram advertising. And uh, many of our customers use hundreds of thousands of euros on Facebook marketing every month. And, and when you reach that scale, there's a lot of things you can't do manually anymore. And we can help with that. So for example, uh, if you are a web store that has millions of different of products, and you cannot really create a nice looking picture for all of them. So we have this dynamic image template feature that can help you with that. Uh, but um, what I'm more working, mostly working on is kind of the optimization algorithms and data science stuff. And I will be covering uh, one of those today in more de detail. And uh, I'm not really here to try to get you to be our customers because there are very little companies in Finland that advertise on the kind of scale that I'm talking about. I'm just trying to get you a glimpse of what is life like in this world. And, and if, you, if this resonates with you, then we are hiring, by the way. But, uh, let's, let's get started. There are some some kind of some major differences if you compare Facebook marketing to some traditional, say, television and magazines and that kind of stuff. And one difference is that it's very measurable. Uh, if you, if I see an ad, I click it, and and I buy something, then uh, through the like the tracker code that the advertisers has on the page, Facebook knows that it was the same person who clicked it and now, now they have purchases. So they can say that this ad has cost uh, 31 purchases or something like that. And another thing, it, it's very targeted. So I can say that I want this ad to reach uh, 20 to 40 year old people who live within 10 kilometers of Helsinki and are married and like dogs, for example. And that's very much doable. And uh, one of the challenges, if, if you're running a system like this, what Facebook is doing, Facebook has almost 2 billion active monthly users, which is an absolutely staggering number. So it, it, it needs kind of this solid foundation. That how, do you, how, do you do, how do you design something like this? How can you decide what, what, what's the price going to be for all of these ads? It, it cannot be some... So it, it doesn't become like a huge pile of mud. And, uh, and the, the answer is basically that the uh, prices will be determined uh, by the markets in such a way that, let's say, um, that this is, I'm, I went to Facebook and Facebook decided that now it's going to show me an ad. And there are some companies that would want to show me this ad. I'm in their target audience for some reason. And in this case, the four companies are all, for some reason, selling me fruits. So there's this apricot, some bananas, and coconuts, and dragon fruit. And all of them will place a bid. And, um, and uh, you won't, probably won't be surprised that the highest bidder will get the ad. So in this case, the apricot company is the one that gets the ad, but the price is not actually the bid that the uh, that the highest bid, but the second highest bid. 
Um, and why would, would this be? Um, well, if you think about it in, in the, a system such as this, the, your own bid only decides whether you win, and it doesn't affect how much you will have to pay if you happen to win. So what this system guarantees is that um, all advertisers will uh, have an incentive to just bid the maximum amount that they would be willing to pay. And there is no incentive to bid higher or lower than that. But uh, let's make this a little bit more complicated. So what if instead of just one ad slot, there are three? How would this work? And, um, and here the slots are not equally valuable because the one is the big one, which you see in your news feed, and then there are two in the kind of the right column, which are smaller, and the user is not looking at them very actively. So let's, uh, to make a simplifying assumption, let's say that uh, these, these smaller ones are uh, one tenth of the value of the, of the big one. So how should we do the auctions? Well, we could do them independently of each other, but that doesn't really work because then, then the same advertiser would just win every auction. And, well, the user doesn't want to see the same ad three times and the advertiser doesn't want to pay for it. So let's not do that. Uh, what's kind of obvious is that it's kind of obvious who should win. The highest bidder should get the large ad, and the two runner-ups should get the smaller ads. But what's not so clear is what should they pay in this, in this instance. So how can we generalize the second highest bid if, if there are multiple slots and they are not all equally valuable? Well, the answer to this is what is called the Vickrey clark Groves auction, where the idea is that each, every every advertiser pays uh, for the total harm that they are causing to others. So here, for example, if the apricot company wouldn't participate, then the banana company would, would get the big slot, and the coconut and dragon fruit would get the smaller slots. So, um, for example, for the banana company, the value that they are getting is decreased, and there's some harm that they are getting. And if we calculate the total harm of all of these other companies, when we see that the apricot company is bringing that much harm to the others, and that is what, what they should pay. And it, it can be proved that Vickery, in the Vickery Clark's gross auction, the optimal strategy is to beat your true value, meaning the largest amount you would be willing to pay. But I'm, I'm not going to present the proof right now. Um, and what is the, what should the bid be then? Um, this is kind of a tautology, but in a sense, the bid should be the probability uh, that when someone sees an ad, they make a conversion, for example, they buy something, times the value of, of someone making that. Um, but uh, the nice thing here is that Facebook will actually, if you want, Facebook will do this to you so that you will only say that this is the value of, of the purchase, the final end product. And Facebook will estimate the probability of conversion based on, on how the users are behaving. And the nice thing is it's not actually just uh, a matter of convenience, but when you do it this way, Facebook will estimate the probability uh, independently for each person in the audience. So if there are people who are Facebook thinks that this is very likely to, to buy the apricots, then that person will get, show, will, be, will get a higher bid. So it will lead to a, a better performance in the end. And uh, just, to be, just to be complete, the actual uh, way the bidding works is there's the probability of conversion which Facebook is optimizing or estimating at the bid that the, user, that the advertiser is setting and then there's kind of this relevance term that is added to it which means that uh, ideally Facebook would want that the ads are so um, engaging that uh, it's, it's almost as good as the other non-ad content you are seeing. So if, if people actually like the ad, 
then that ad will get more views. And um, a little digression about, I, I was talking about the true value, meaning that what, what is the most uh, that people are, that the advertiser is willing to pay. So it might sound a little bit like, um, oh, let, let's put it this way. It, it's not a question of, of like morality or ethics or, or like we are not, the point is not that we should um, prevent the advertisers from lying about their true value. The, the nice thing about if you use a method where you can just bid your true value, the nice thing is that then you have the luxury of kind of ignoring what your competitors are doing. So uh, even though finding out your, what's your, your own bid is, 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 is really a hard question, but it's, at least it's kind of an isolated question that you can, you can shut your eyes and, and don't worry about what the other, other ones are doing. You can just look at your own business and, and try to come up with a number. Um, okay, um, but this is basically the, the foundation that um, Facebook is working on and we as a Facebook marketing partner have to understand and, and have to build on. And Facebook is also building things on top of, the, top of that uh, themselves. So one of the questions is uh, how would you handle uh, something more realistic than, uh, for example, if there's a finite budget like before we assume that every advertiser is just going to buy all of the ads that they can get as long as the bid is met but uh, but in reality there's going to be a finite budget for example i'm not gonna use more than 100 euros in uh, per day for this ad so so the problem would be that if, if that this happens um, if, if the budget runs out during the middle of the day, then that's kind of bad because there are going to be, because not all of the conversions are equally cheap. There are, some of them are expensive and some of them are not expensive. And for example here, the budget ran out during the day and now there's some cheap conversions in the evening that we missed. So what Facebook is doing is they provide a feature called pacing which kind of um, uh, predicts how, how, the, is, uh, how the budget is going to last. And, and, tries, and if the bid is too high, that it's going to run out of the budget too soon, then it's going to decrease the bid. And with all of this, it kind of leaves us in a very tight, tight corner, like what, what, left, what is there left to do for a partner like us if, if Facebook is already optimizing optimizing all of this stuff and um, but there are some some corners here and there we, where we can where we can fit and one in particular is what we call our predictive budget allocation so let's let's dig into that a little bit uh, for the purposes of, of this you can think of a campaign it's, it's kind of a collection of ads that have the same goal so they may be directed to slightly different audiences and and, and they have uh, different images and different text, but they, the goal that is being measured is, is the same. And, and when we're doing that, the, obviously the campaign budget should go to the best performing ads because the, the, the goal is the same. So we should, we should find which ads are the best and, and use the money on those. But when we are doing this, we kind of have this balance between like exploration and exploitation at the same time we need to um, we need to put money on all of the ads so that we can see which of them are actually doing well but we could but then we also need to exploit the knowledge that we know that this ad is doing very well and we should we should put money there and this is very close to a classical kind of machine learning problem called the multi-armed bandit, where it's, uh, it's, it's kind of, uh, if you know one-armed bandit, like the slot machine where you draw the arm and, and you may win something. In, in the multi-armed bandit, there are multiple arms and, and the probability, and each arm has a fixed probability of producing 
producing a win, uh, but we don't know the probabilities and we are trying to iterate and, and get some information about, about those probabilities. And this is, uh, this is uh, kind of hard to solve exactly, but there's a very good approximate solution, which is that uh, at any given time, we, we estimate that what, are the, what is the probability for a given, given arm of the bandit, or, or in this case, a given, given ad, what is the probability that that ad is the best performing one, and that will be the, the proportion of the budget. So, for example, if we think that there's a 50% probability that this particular ad is the best one, then, um, then that will get 50% of the budget of that entire campaign. And we implemented this kind of from scratch. We originally did it using R, but at some point we decided that it's um, better to to switch to Python, and we kind of did a line-by-line -line, uh, conversion to it. There's a blog post about it uh, on our web page, and it, it, it's based on basically sampling that we, once we get the posterior distribution, distribution then we can kind of easily get, get just like a lot of samples and see what, what percentage of them, uh, in what percentage of them, uh, the, what add is the best. And it started very simple because we uh, we have this kind of we have to get things out fast. So in the beginning it was uh, it was uh, not taking a lot lot of data into account. It was just taking like let's take yesterday and and yesterday's data and and hope that it it works enough and it worked very well. But uh, we have been and we are still improving it uh, more so we can uh, we can use like very very like standard things like hierarchical models so that if we have some kind of prior information that that this account uh, in this uh, what what things are looking at this account usually then that that's kind of a good level of hierarchy or this campaign is similar to this campaign so we expect that these would uh, work the same way and we are building we are trying to get it better better understand the time series aspect so that when for example in the traditional multi armed bandit there's a fixed the when you when you draw the bar there's always a fixed probability but here it can vary so we have to take that into account and and most recently we've been working on on kind of optimizing for revenue which means that um that first we, we just wanted to get as much, like maximize the number of conversions and to get as many purchases as possible. But um, later, but, but, but in the end, what we actually would want to optimize is, is kind of the, for example, if it's a web store, then some of the conversions might be that user bought something that cost 10 euros and someone else bought something that cost 1000 euros. So it's it's kind of not just the number of purchases made, but the revenue that comes from them. And and when we are working on this, there's kind of things that are uh, kind of important to us in particular is is we have to get things implemented very fast because whenever we do something, then Facebook if if it's valuable and Facebook doesn't have it, then the chances are that Facebook will implement it themselves someday. So we kind of have to push things out very fast. And and uh, another important thing to us is, is kind of a robustness, uh, because our algorithms make real decisions about large sums of money, and they have to do a reasonable thing, even if they are faced with unexpected circumstances. And, and this, we don't have like super many customers. We have big customers, but not super many. But it's still not not that we we cannot have a human that that like sanity checks every decision that the algorithms make. It's not feasible. Um, and customer impact is also also very important uh, in the sense that if if I would be in an academy like 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 university. 
then I could al always focus on the things that I would I, I think is the theoretically most important, like theoretically most interesting thing. But when working in a business, then obviously you have to look at what is the what is the feature that would bring most value to our customers. And uh, one more is explainability, and what I mean by that is that um, when uh, for our customers to use our features, they have to trust them, and for them to trust them, they we we have to first be able to explain them that what what is it that they are doing, and if if we have some kind of magic black box that we don't even ourselves understand, and and we just say that this this takes a lot of data and 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 outputs good numbers, then no one will dare use it. So in that sense, we are kind of limited and. Um, or let's say we are uh, biased uh, towards using uh, kind of very simple and straightforward methods. But uh, one example of something that is not so important in, is performance in the sense of, of how fast the code runs, because um, servers are cheap compared to human time and and and, and then the time that that's t that will take to optimize things. So. If it, if we want to, so for example, if, if predictive budget allocation would magic magically become 100 times faster than it's now, then it wouldn't actually make much of a difference for the company after all. And as a general, general kind of feeling that where we are going, that where where we started was was when very kind of this ad hoc thing that we just kind of hack together anything that works. And, and we, we build things ourselves from scratch and, and we have very different, like distinct features. Like we have this feature that will optimize the budgets and we have this feature that will optimize bits and we have for, for all of these very different things. And, and the direc direction that we kind of, I, I feel that we're in inevitably going is, is we have to start doing things more kind of the right way, more, more structured way. So, for example, uh, we are looking into getting getting some libraries, like standard libraries. For example, we are trying Stan, uh, so that so that we could we could do these uh, things in a kind of, kind of more more according to the best practices. Like, for example, when I was was doing vari variational Bayes, there's, there was really clear separation of, of what is the probabilistic model and what are the approximations that we need to make in order to 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 make it make it feasible and what is the uh, like the actual uh, optimization algorithm that we are using and and in in our case what we are where we are now is is kind of this more of this ad hoc thing where where all of these are kind of blurred together and we have this thing that uh, that works in practice but uh, when things are getting more complicated, then we will need to, when the models are getting more complicated, then we will need to do, do things uh, in, a, in a more disciplined way. But th I don't mean that, that what we have been doing before was a mistake, because we had a very tight time pressure. We had to get things out. But now, if we want to stay ahead of the game, uh, we have to do some of these things uh, you know, in a kind of a more well, more disciplined way, to put it short. And and the final item is is that before when we have kind of these distinct things that we have uh, distinct th some something that optimizes budgets and something that optimizes bids, and these will kind of inevitably inevitably uh, fuse into into one. Or, or very few optimization features that will because they they have a lot of interconnections and um, we cannot do the, our best work unless uh, unless we do do the decisions like uh, with uh, unless the features actually know about each other and the best way that they can know about each other is if there's just one feature so to say but um uh, thank you, and please, if you have any questions, then I would be happy to answer.
so first he implemented it in R and then in Python, yeah? Yes. So why so? And is it true? Because I heard that in R it's very difficult to code things somehow. It's, it's easy to make a code which you can run as a script, but it's very difficult to, in, uh, to implement it into the system. Is it because of that or some other reason? Mm, yeah, um, I, I don't have a lot, I don't have a like very, very, very definite answer to that. But uh, my 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 own experience with R is is that it's very very well suited to kind of interactive programming, where you where you type the type something to the console and you get the get the answer. But when you when you have to, are trying to build something that's very robust and and there there are some things in R that are kind of counterproductive when it when it comes to trying to build reliable things so for example er error handling is is one of those areas and and for us the python and r were actually kind of uh, python with using pandas and and in, in particular we were very similar the, so the translation was actually very easy easy to do and, and we were also getting people joining the company who were more fluent with python so we just kind of decided to go with it. Hope that answered a part of your question at least. Hi, Veli. Um, maybe one more, one a bit more of a business related question, but you mentioned kind of, you kind of touched upon the topic of, of Facebook implementing the same kind of, same kind of uh, methods as you, that you're doing. Do you think there's a big risk that, that they kind of take over your business by, by implementing the same kind of ideas? Um, uh, well, to be short, yes, there is there definitely is that risk, and uh, we will have to like keep uh, we, we we will have to keep our speed. There there are some things that that could we could do that that will have a like longer lasting leverage, and and one of them is that uh, for some customers there's there's this data they, that they won't don't want to give to Facebook because. It is kind of too business critical for them to give, and but they could give it to us. So, so that that's kind of a, one area where in future we we might be able to 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 keep our lead, so to speak. Hi, uh, I wanted to ask about testing or methods. So, when you develop a new algorithm, can you test it based on purely historical data, or do you do some kind of A/B testing? And if you do A/B testing, is it problematic that kind of some customers maybe have to pay pay some money so that just that you can fit your model parameters better and then other customers benefit from that um yeah that's that's a very good question um face what we, we do a b testing and and what facebook has is this um like a proper proper a b testing where you actually kind of everyone in the audience flips a metaphorical coin and and they are divided into two parts that, that have nothing to do with each other. And like the part, people in part A see the one ad and people in part C, they see the other, ad, other ads. So we can actually do very valid statistical testing. Uh, the customers will are, are paying for, for this, but at the same time, the customers who participate in, in, in these tests are uh, like, we, we don't, we don't do it for them. Uh, we, we do it in, in cooperation with them, and and, it, and the lessons that we learn are also beneficial for uh, for the for the customers. So for so we haven't actually had uh, much problems trying to find customers that are willing to try things out with us. Um, most of the users they use application, and hence they see all this advertisement. But part of us is a little bit more paranoid and run the browser with no script and stuff, and we actually do not see that beep thing. Mm. So besides the economical impact on the Facebook and uh, your customers, mm. what is the algorithmic impact on the data you have? Um, can you can you be a um, Basically, uh, when you collect the data, mm. does it have any impact that we are not actually shown anything besides they try to present something to us? Because I don't see mm. any advertisement for last seven or eight years, precisely, in any like mm. Google, Facebook, whatever, mm. Twitter. 
So I just wonder mm. how they are impacted by us a little nasty boys. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a fact that that we are, and, and everyone in this space is aware of that. There are people who who don't see the advertisements, but 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 I, I don't because most of what we are doing is kind of just based on proportions that, that this this ad is doing better than this. So so it it, it in that sense, if, if there's like a twenty percent missing, then we are just. We are always just looking at the people who see the ads and people who use Facebook and, and don't don't have ad blocker for for example. So that's that's kind of kind of out of sight for us in a way, if if, if that makes sense. So it's uh, we we are aware of that, but there's not really much we can do about it. What kind of other services could you offer to customers? Um, what kind of other services? Um, well, one one big thing is our, which is our like more non-technical thing is is our support, uh, because Facebook doesn't offer offer very very good support uh, compared to us. We have kind of this twenty-four hour chat support where where the customers can can ask the questions anytime and and everyone in our company is is answering answering them so if you if one of our customers asks something it might be me who's answering or, or it might be our ceo who's answering and um, that's that's kind of a way f both for us to give good service and and to keep us close to to the customers and understand what their pain points are Probably you heard about uh, GDPR, and uh, what does it mean for your company? What changes uh, you should do according to it? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't get the, early, the uh, beginning. GDPR, it is like a nightmare for all data scientists uh, when they should handle customers' data properly. Mm. I'm, I'm sorry, I still... Uh, okay. Ah, okay. Okay. Um, uh, one thing with us that that currently we don't actually have have much of kind of uh, private information because what Facebook is giving us is is kind of these aggregates. We we get get the number that that, that people saw this ad and and clicked it and 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 35 of them ended up purchasing but we don't get anything that where where we could identify individual pe persons so in in that sense the data that we have is well it's it's confidential of course but it's it's not 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 the kind of uh, high risk data that that facebook themselves have so in in that sense we are we are um we are, we are have have the easier easier job here. If, if I'm I'm not sorry if I understood that. Does did that answer that at all? Okay, good. <laughs> 